Hello, today we have uh, Dr. Maria Fasli, uh, who is the head of uh, the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering from the University of Essex in the UK. Maria has studied computer science in the same university, but uh, first I would like to give you uh, the opportunity to introduce herself. Please, Maria, welcome to Mexico. Thank you, uh, Carlos. Thank you for the hospitality and for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to um, come and, uh, and talk to you. Um, I'm a member of staff in the School of Computer Science and Electronic uh, Engineering at the University of Essex. That's where I did my postgraduate studies, my, my PhD. Before that, I started my, my career, my education as a, as a computer scientist, so that was my, my first degree. But as part of my PhD, I moved and I started working into artificial intelligence, theories of intelligent systems. And then I became a member of, um, of staff at the University of Essex in the School of Computer Science. Uh, and I started working on theoretical aspects of, I continued to work on theoretical aspects of agents and multi-agent systems, as well as on practical applications. I'm currently serving as the, the head of the school. Uh, this is more of an um, administration, stroke management, stroke leadership role. So I'm responsible for the strategic direction of the, of the school. I'm responsible for leading into a variety of initiatives, including research, curriculum development, uh, curriculum development teaching, and I'm overall responsible of the, of the school and, and the, the things that we, we, we deliver to our students. That's very interesting because these are like different activities that you have done apart from the teaching and the research that you normally mm. do. Um, what's the aim of uh, being here in Mexico, visiting different universities, uh, visiting these different universities, especially this university, um, sharing your experience? Um, I think um, you identified something quite crucial, that I have moved and I have done different things at different times in, uh, in my life. But I've always believed that to actually make progress, you need to talk to people, to generate ideas, exchange ideas, and, and just pose questions. So if you like, my, the aim of my visit is just to talk to people, just to talk to students, and just ask them to think about critical issues on, on research in, in our field, in my field, agents and, and multi-agent systems, so that I can inspire them to progress in this, in this field and, and do the work that is required, really. All right, that's very interesting. Um, we are a very young university. Actually, the university is 38 uh, years uh, was uh, founded 38 years ago. Our campus is only uh, has been created only seven years ago. What would you recommend, or what would you give us as hints to a very young campus? What should we do to to mm -hmm. actually develop as a, as an institution for research and education? Um, I think uh, there are uh, parallels between the University of Essex and, and your institution. We are, we are a very young institution our, ourselves in comparison to other universities in the UK. Uh, we were established in 1967 and one of the things that we've, we've always been um, striving to do is be excellent in, in research but also deliver excellent education to our, to our students. But these are, do not need to be treated as separate things. I think they need to go hand in hand because uh, we, we are here as educators to actually educate the next generation of scientists that are going to continue our work. So in that sense, we also need to inspire them by getting them involved in the research that we do uh, so that they can, they can see the opportunities, they can see why working in a field is so, is so exciting so that they can, they can progress the, the, the field. Now you were talking about students. What about society? I mean, why computer science and information technology should be important? I mean, they are important for society, not only for experts. Why do you think is that? And how are, are we going to show society that mm. information technologies and computer science are important? Uh, this is a very good question. Um, computing, uh, information technology, communications, networks, nowadays they underpin almost every human activity. Um, and yes, there are places still in the, in, in the world, around the globe, where information and communication technologies have not reached or they're not as widely used. But if you look at um, uh, the, the, the United States, Europe, Asia, we are all using more and more technologies in our everyday lives. And 
there are people that can't think of operating in their day-to-day -day lives without devices like mobile phones. And these technologies are here to stay. They're not gonna, they're not gonna stop. Uh, they are going to be more and more embedded into our everyday lives and we just need to be aware that they are, they are there. They are operating in a seamless kind of uh, way. So it, the society is, is, it is of paramount importance that people realize that these technologies are here to stay and they're here to make our lives easier. Um, but obviously it, it's all about how you use technology. That's true. Um, what about, uh, I want to concentrate now on the teaching side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are several technologies, platforms, tools that normally yes. we as lecturers use for our daily teaching. Um, how would you um, tell us how technology should be used mm -hmm. for, for teaching? We know that you've got a very prestigious award, a national award, British award, mm -hmm. uh, because of the innovative teaching that you have done in, uh, in your career a few years ago. Can you tell us about more about this? Um, okay, you, you've, you've raised two, um, two, two separate questions. Technology uh, can be used in, in teaching, but I think it's very important not to see it as the only way you can deliver teaching. Uh, I think it's very important that as educators, we remain passionate about what we, what we do, and we just strive to get the students involved in the, and engaged in our, in our teaching. And no technology can do that if you don't have an educator behind the scenes who thinks about what is it that the students need to learn, what is the best way to approach a topic or get them engaged. So motivation for me is really, um, is, is really of paramount impo importance and that's how, that's how students get to learn. You need, you need to approach a subject in such a way so that you can make it relevant to them, you can show to them how it can, how it can help them. Um, and then, if technology can help you deliver uh, your, your teaching in a, in a more efficient way, then you can do so. But I, I don't think that technology is the solution to delivering good teaching. It, it has to be considered in parallel with more traditional methods of teaching. So if you were to ask me, for instance, do you see technology as ever replacing humans? Uh, I think it would be, I don't think it would be such a good idea. Because I think it's key that you have an educator who is actually able to motivate students, get them engaged in the, in the subject matter. Now I have used technology quite a lot in the teaching, uh, in my teaching throughout the, the years, and you mentioned that I, um, I, got a, I got an award, a national award, a National Teaching Fellowship, it's called in the, in the UK, and that was for work that I've done with my, with my students enriching uh, my traditional methods of teaching with technology, uh, but um, doing things like collaborative teaching or putting the students in a setting where they can experiment on their own, they can learn on their own, but they can also learn with each other. And there are different ways that you can, you can do that. For instance, one of, one of the things that I've done is we've, um, we've developed a platform that enables you to build scenarios that then the students can explore in their own time and in their own pace. Now, um, to do that, uh, obviously requires a lot of thinking because what's behind the scenes is learning objectives. What is it at the end of the day that you, you're asking the student or you want the student to learn? And the way we've done that is by presenting a problem in, in such a way that it looks as if uh, the students are almost participating in a game or they have this, uh, this, th this uh, facility that enables them to try different things and learn from the interaction with the system, but also from each other. So yes, they learn by interacting with the system, but we also put them in a collaborative setting uh, and they can exchange ideas with each other and that's where they learn best. What you have said about this platform is uh, also very interesting because um, what I was wondering is if there is behind this any pedagogical things that mm. have to be taken into consideration or you have a team of uh, sociologists or um, uh, psychologists to actually 
help you to develop this mm. platform or how, how, how did you come up with this idea of this new platform for combining this traditional learning with uh, the e-learning thing? H how did you come up with mm. this? I've, um, I've always been passionate about teaching. Uh, and I've always tried to engage the students with, with the teaching materials. So I've always been looking for things that I can do with them that are perhaps a little bit outside the, the norm. And I have a personal interest in, in pedagogical uh, methods, innovation in learning and teaching. And one of the things that uh, I came across is uh, there are things that you can, you can do and you can present challenges to students that almost resemble games so you can present a scenario that looks like a game and then the students engage with this game but obviously the game needs to be designed in such a way so that there are clear learning objectives that need to be achieved behind the scenes. So that is the difficult thing. It's not playing a game for the sake of playing a game. It's constructing a scenario that looks like a game but behind the scenes what is taking place is the students are looking for instance at different artificial intelligence algorithms or they're improving their programming skills but that is that is a personal interest of mine in um, uh, looking at new innovative ways of teaching and delivering materials that otherwise might appear a bit dry all right. Um, you have uh, raised some very good uh, things w with this platform and with this way of uh, innovative teaching. This is related, obviously, with your research, mm -hmm. which is basically agents and multi-agent systems, multi-agent technologies, e uh, agent technology for e-commerce, etc. Everything that you have all, uh, already told us. Um, this is an interdisciplinary. Uh, thing because you need many disciplines to actually ac accomplish this. From your point of view, um, this agent technology and this agent uh, field in which you are working, which is the artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence mainly, what kind of disciplines do you think are there, are involved to, to, mm. to actually um, link together with, uh, with your work? Mm. I can go on for a very long time regarding a list of disciplines that would fit into my fit into my own work as well as uh, the whole area of artificial intelligence and agents and multi-agent systems. They agents and multi-agent systems as an area doesn't stand on its own. It takes input and also provides output to other um, disciplines. When we talk about multi-agent systems, you basically think in terms of having multiple pieces of software that are smart on their own, but they are able to interact with each other. So we're talking about uh, pieces of software that interact on a, at a social level, let's say. And if you are considering these kind of questions, then the natural discipline you need to look uh, for, for input, for, for advice, if you like, is sociology. In, right. in, in computer science, you wouldn't be looking at how society operates or how organizations are structured, um, things like roles, concepts like roles in organizations, authority relations, all of this input comes from, from sociology. Also, if you're talking about intelligent systems that can interact with humans, not in the standard command line interface or by just clicking on, on options that you get on a, on, in, front of a, in front of a screen, but more in conversational ways, then you're talking about natural language analysis. You need to look at what has been the work that has been done in language and linguistics. Um, fundamentally, mathematics underpins computer science and electronic engineering and communication. So that's another discipline. If you are treating pieces of software as smart, then you delve into issues that have to do more with philosophy. So how would you describe such a system? Would you describe it as having things like attitudes like belief, uh, beliefs, knowledge, desires, intentions? What do these mean? Uh, and these are not traditionally studied in computer science. They are studied in uh, philosophy, for instance, or, or logic. 
So you have to look at these disciplines. You have to look at things like um, in, in disciplines like uh, finance, economics, because a lot of the applications of agents and multi-agent systems are in the area of e-commerce and so many other disciplines that all can, can help us create more, more clever, more interactive uh, systems that can help us, the users. Right. Talking about this interdisciplinary work or fields, mm -hmm. uh, we've got a master's degree, uh, interdisciplinary master's degree is unique in Mexico. Uh, we are in a very particular faculty which is uh, comprised of three departments. The, comp the information technologies department, the design department and the communication science department. So we um, develop a master's degree which combines these three departments. From your point of view, we know that in Essex, they have, you have just mentioned it, they, you have a master's degree, a postgraduate mm -hmm. uh, studies combining economics, um, uh, finance and com computer science. Could you tell us more about your experience of mm -hmm. uh, working with people that are not actually from the computer science field? Mm -hmm. How do you actually communicate with them? Mm -hmm. How do you solve these uh, language problems? Mm -hmm because sometimes uh, some words can mean something in one uh, specific field and in a different field they can mean something different. So mm. uh, tell us about your experience about um, this. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. When you uh, talk about interdisciplinary research or interdisciplinary postgraduate programs or undergraduate programs, you obviously think in terms of people coming from different backgrounds with different perspectives. So you might get somebody from computer science talking to somebody from sociology or finance or, or economics. And you will have different backgrounds. You are also going to be using a different language. But I think it's very important to go into these talks into a dialogue with the other, the other uh, colleagues that you want to work with. Um, Open-minded and with one thing in mind that ultimately at the end of the day what you all want to achieve is progress in the field or work together. So you need to establish a common language uh, in the beginning, uh, a common vocabulary. So when I say X uh, and it means one thing in computer science and you come from economics and it means something different, we need to establish a common vocabulary um, and a common understanding so that we can base our, our future future discussions. And it's also important, I think, not to try and grab things and claim as if they belong to your discipline or my discipline. Uh, because sometimes that can lead to problems. If people are not able to talk to each other, we end up rediscovering the same things in different disciplines from a slightly different perspective and we just lose valuable time. So we just need to learn to speak to each other and be patient if um, we are using slightly different vocabulary and it takes time. These collaborations usually take some time to work out but if you are able to do it then you end up with very good results that can actually benefit not just your own discipline but other uh, disciplines as well and uh, that's how you can progress the, the field. What's the, what's the best way of uh, doing this collaboration between the different disciplines? Through seminars, mm. through talks, or probably proposing new projects, or how, how can we accomplish this uh, similar vocabulary? How can we accomplish mm. this? I, I think it's very important to provide the opportunities and bring people together. Um, we all lead very busy lives. And um, I wish I can provide a one-off solution for, for everyone. But I think the way I would go about, and that's how we actually do it, we've started doing it in, uh, in computer science and electronic engineering, is to just create opportunities for colleagues to talk to each other. So, um, for instance, organizing interdisciplinary workshops. Uh, coming up with a topic that perhaps you are aware that would be of interest to a number of different colleagues, perhaps coming from different disciplines, and just getting them to talk to each other, perhaps by uh, starting with a presentation of what is the, the work that they are doing, uh, what are their particular interests, what are the questions that they would like to answer. That's how you can get people talking. And the more you do that, the more 
colleagues, other, other people see that this is a valuable thing and they're willing to participate. But unless you actually engineer these opportunities, sometimes people find it difficult to find the time to go out there proactively and do it, do it on their own. So it's all about, I think, creating the opportunities and making sure that you, you get the right message across, that this is for the benefit of everyone. All right. And we can learn uh, from each other, if you like. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's um, a question that I still have, because um, I know that there should be a desire from the people to actually make interdisciplinary things. Mm. If they don't really want to do it, well, interdisciplinary is not going to take place. But who's actually responsible of this uh, interdisciplinary thing? And other question would be, is it possible to teach, uh, to, to incorporate in the teaching agenda um, some interdisciplinary activities mm. in order to actually teach how to be interdisciplinary? Mm. Um, very interesting questions. I'll try and answer them um, as, as I go along. Who is responsible for, if you like, moving the agenda forward for in interdisciplinarity? There are, I don't think there's a right answer to this. There's ultimately everyone is, re is responsible because I think if we continue to work in silos as scientists, where we are losing out, the disciplines are losing out. Uh, however, we as leaders, and I'm talking my, about myself in, in my current role as, 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 as head of department, for instance, I have a particular responsibility to make sure that my, my colleagues um, understand the significance, the importance of undertaking interdisciplinary research and interfacing with sub-areas within our own discipline, computer science and electronic engineering, but also looking outside and getting inspiration, talking to other colleagues and looking at problems from different perspectives and looking for solutions that perhaps haven't thought about, um, but getting, getting input from, from other areas. Um, so I hope that answers your, your, your first question. Yeah, talking about this, again, this interdisciplinary work, do you think there must be or um, yeah, there must be a link between the public and private sectors and the university on how, how could it be accomplished? Because we know in, mm. the, in the UK this is a very normal yeah. uh, uh, way of uh, working. So could you elaborate a bit more about universities this? Universities in the UK are being seen, if you like, as the incubators of research. Um, our role is to develop the, f the field, so we come up our, our role as researchers is to, to look at what the problems are and look at, lo look at uh, developing innovative solutions. But then um, you also need collaboration from the public sector and the private sector because ultimately our, our ideas, they need to be taken out there and they need to be developed into products, uh, solutions, if we're talking about software solutions, for instance. So it's very important that um, universities engage with both the public sector and the um, in the private sector in what it can be understood as knowledge exchange activities, if you like. Because ultimately, our, the knowledge that we generate, it needs, to re it needs to reach the public. It needs to reach users, end users. That's what we are here to do, develop the things that are needed by end users. Perhaps not now, but maybe in a few years' time. All right. Just to finish up this uh, great conversation, we would like to, to thank you to, for being here. This is, we know this is your first time in Mexico. Uh, thank you. And if you want to say something else, some final remarks, or if you want to give uh, your perception of Mexican mm. universities, please, please um, do. Well, I would like to thank you and, and the university for, for hosting me and for giving me um, and the opportunity to talk to colleagues here because that's how you, you generate ideas and to, to students and hopefully um, I, can, I can talk to them and I can inspire them to continue to do, to do, the, to do the work. And um, I just hope that this is one of the many visits in perhaps in, in, time, in, in the very near future to, to Mexico. Yeah, absolutely. You are welcome to come again next year when we actually have our uh, new uh, campus. I Thank very you very much, much. Look forward to. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you, Carlos.